there are still things today. There are things I can't talk about today, not because of being mm. sick or anything like that, because, I mean, one of them, it may it make me well up if I even talk about it. I'm not over it. And because um, you come across, you don't just come across scary stuff, you come across incredibly sad stuff, heartbreaking stuff. Yeah. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Conversation Podcast with your host, best-selling author, Nadine Matheson. As always, I hope that you're well. I hope that you've had a good week. And can I tell you what I'm looking forward to this week? It's because it's Easter week. And that means it's a four-day weekend in the UK. And also, I think most of the Commonwealth countries, it is a four-day weekend where I have nothing planned but to just chill out, read my books, watch movies, hang out with my family and eat my body weight in sweets and possibly Easter egg. Like that's my plan. That will be it. And I hope that you're going to be doing the same. (laughs) Anyway, let's get on with the show. This week, my guest is author Neil Lancaster. Neil Lancaster's backstory is absolutely amazing. In 1983, he joined the RAF where he worked as a military policeman. And after six years, he left and joined the Met Police where he was a covert policing specialist. Yes, that means he was working undercover, following serial killers, human traffickers. What else have we got? Drug dealers, fraudsters. Neil was that man. And then after, what, nearly 30 years, he left and he's now an author and he's the author of the D.S. Craigie crime series. But I'm not going to tell you anymore because you really do need to hear from Neil Lancaster yourself. So in today's episode, Neil Lancaster and I talk about the moments that lived with him as a detective, how over 30 years of policing prepared him for author life and how you ride your luck as an author. Now, as always, sit back, we'll go for a walk and enjoy the conversation. So Neil Lancaster, welcome to The Conversation. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you I'm for having me. I'm glad to have you here. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, I've got my first question for you is, right, I was doing my research into you even mm-hmm. though I've know, I know you and I've met you several mm-hmm. times in person, I've seen my research and you retired at 49. Is that correct? I it is like correct. I was yeah. examining you. Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, no, so I did. You, what was your plan? Because at such a young age to retire. Well, I, I left school at 17 with no qualifications and then I joined the RAF. So, and I did six mm-hmm. years in the RAF as a, as a military policeman and then joined the Met. And then did 25. But of course, because I was in the RAF first, I got five years nearly of pension. So it meant right. that my 30 years in, because I'm old, I'm on the old pension scheme, meant that I could retire on a full pension at 49. And, and we'd had this dream, my wife and me and my son, Ollie, had had this dream that we would move to the Highlands of Scotland because we'd been visiting it for many years and love it very dearly up here. And um, that's what we did. We just decided we were living in St. Albans, which is as I'm sure you know, like a little sort of suburbia provincial town, really nice, yeah. north of London. But I was commuting into London every day, which was destroying me. The actual commute was, was killing me. I hated it so much, you know, three hours minimum a day. And I just, we just said, let's do it, let's do it. And so we moved 600 miles north to the Highlands. And I now live in this rural idyll with views all the way to the Cairngorms. I'm looking out now to a very white landscape because we've had a big dump of snow. And and that was it. And then I I found myself, yeah, because I did, my plan was didn't extend beyond. Let's move to the Highlands. I didn't know what yeah. I was going to do with myself. And although I sort of you know I was having a pension, it wasn't really enough to live on long term. You know, I, I would need to do something else, and also for you know your sanity. So I did a bit mucking about. I I, I do this thing. I, I'm an evacuee. I'm still actually do this. I'm an evacuee support officer which means if anyone gets evacuated off, a, off an oil rig, I'm there to support them. And I'm supposed to set up like reception centres if there's a major evacuation off a rig, because obviously, you know, north of Scotland, you've got the rigs not, you know, going out yeah. of the North Sea. I've never been called out, ever. But they do still pay me a retainer. So it, it's like money for sitting at home, which is perfect. But then I did some work as a private investigator. And it was, it was, Awful. I hated it. And I why was, was it? Why I, was it awful? It, because well, you, you know, it's like we go I, back to you, like, you know, you yeah. were at the RAF and then you was in the police force. You were in the Met for God knows yeah. how many years, doing covert policing and all of that. 
and then you, you become a private investigator and you hate it. Yeah, well, yeah, because I, I mean, there's no crime up here, you know. There's, well, I mean, you know, obviously there is crime, but compared to other stuff, you know, this is a very peaceful place. So there's nothing significant happening. And really, it all sounds great because everyone thinks private investigator and they think, you know, gumshoes, you know, going out doing all this. But I was investigating. I was, you know, remember I was a covert detective working at the top end of serious crime investigation. And they got me up here investigating the fact that there's been a crash on the A82. And, or, oh, uh, one time, this was funny. This, I got a phone call because I, I, I was with a, with some sort of an agency and they said, there's, uh, there's a woman who thinks her boyfriend, not even husband, boyfriend is playing away. Can you use some surveillance on the, on the boyfriend? So I said, well, yeah, I guess so. And he was the most boring man in the world. Bearing in mind, I've done surveillance behind, you know, major international criminals, gangsters, murderers, Levi Belfield, all this sort yeah. of stuff. Now I'm behind a bloke who works at a <laughs> garage all day, goes home and gets himself a takeaway and a carry out of six cans of lager and doesn't leave his house again. So I decided that wasn't for me. And um, I was I was crap at it and because I was lazy and didn't want to do it. I was not interested in, I, you know, people had lost, had their car stolen in dodgy circumstances. And I thought, I don't really care. So I, I, but I'm a big, you know, probably like yourself, been a massive reader my whole life. And, you know, I, when all my pals are reading the Beano, I mean, much as I read, I'd read the Beano today if you gave me a copy. However, that's by the by. I, I was reading thrillers aged 11. I was reading like Alistair MacLean, Desmond Bagley, Dick Francis, all this sort of stuff at 12. And I'd never really stopped reading. And I'd been, I was walking all the time up here because I didn't have much else to do with my dog up in the forest and all that sort of stuff. And I was listening to audiobooks and loving them and getting all excited by it. And then I thought, just literally thought, I wonder if I could write a book. And then I didn't give it any more thought than that. And then I opened the laptop one day and I got a basic idea for a story about <laughs> an undercover detective who sent in to <laughs> investigate a corrupt solicitor. Now, <laughs> I'm not offended at all. I'm not offended. Now, this was inspired by, I use the word inspired by, a case I actually ran into a corrupt solicitor a corrupt immigration solicitor who was facilitating large-scale breaches of immigration law by organising and facilitating sham marriages between non-Europeans and Europeans. Massive industrial scale. At least a thousand times he's done it. And he was a really unpleasant man. But it inspired me. I thought, well, there's a story. There's a something to write about. So I did this story and I wrote this book quite quickly and got, you know, I sent it out to, like we all do, Sent it out widely and got widely rejected because it, you know, the book wasn't really ready. But then I worked on it and got some advice from some people. And I wrote it again. I got a deal with a small publisher, a small publisher called Burning Chair, which were just a little much small press. And the books actually did okay. You know, they, they sold reasonable numbers. I mean, you know, not knocking, knocking any, anything out of the park, but they sold okay. It gave me some inspiration to keep trying and trying to get better. And so that's how I ended up being a writer. So kind of unconventional route. I didn't do any courses. I I didn't do any any sort of, you know, creative writing courses. I, did, I didn't do anything. I just um, opened the laptop and started typing. It's going to sound like a really silly question. It may be offensive, but did you know what you were doing? When you sat down that first day and opened up your laptop or whatever it was, or your notebook. Not really. Did you know what you Not really. No, I, I read the basics. They said that a manuscript should be 12 point font, aerial or whatever, double spaced, paragraphs indented, header and a foot, page numbers. I set that up and I literally, I just kind of went with the sort of things I'd read and I'd read really mm. widely. And I, I've come up with a theory about this is that when I was young, and into these books, there was one particular book. As well. I, I view it as my biggest inspiration. It's a book called Running Blind by Desmond Bagley, who's a massive author in the 70s. This book was published in 1970, and it's about a lapsed spy called back in reluctantly to do a job in Iceland that he really didn't want to do, and he smells a rat, and it's a massive, great, multi-handed conspiracy. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. 
I loved it so much, I read it multiple times. I read it until it fell to pieces. And I think what that did was kind of, because I was so young, you know, I was I, I was 11 or something like that. But because your brain's incredibly malleable, I think it sort yeah. of imprinted on me. The, the, the lessons, because Bagley was such a genius, brilliant writer in terms of pacing, structure, revelation, twists, that I think maybe it went into my subconscious. And so I think I kind of did a creative writing degree as a <laughs> 10-year-old, self-taught, just by reading a, one book that I still think stands up brilliantly today and reading it over and over and over again, literally until it fell to bits. And then I you built know, on that by reading a lot more. Yeah. That's you know, how I think back, it happened. You know, back in your policing days, yeah, in your covert policing days, was it, was there any time when you thought to yourself, you know, I, I need to do something else? Or was your job so all consuming, you couldn't see beyond the job? It, exactly that. Because, yeah. you know what, I didn't, I did really badly at school. I failed all my exams. I had to get, I got English and history O-levels on retakes. So, so, so school was something I just wanted to get away from. I just wanted to leave. It's a really bad school I went to. Uh, you know, even though everyone thinks, I grew up in Seven Oaks in Kent. And although everyone thinks Seven Oaks is dead posh, of course it is. But it still has some rough parts. Yeah. And all the posh kids went to Seven Oaks school or Judd school in Tunbridge or private schools. All the rough kids went to the school I went to. And so I just wanted to get away from school. And so I didn't give it any thought. But the one thing that stuck in my mind was I remember doing some writing in English and I came up with some sort of wild story based on probably Desmond Bagley's book. And one teacher said, this is really good. You genuinely have some talent. Please don't lose this. Please build on it. You could write. And of course, I, I didn't do anything about it. I was, you know, got, but didn't do anything about it. But 40 years later, I actually did have that in my mind. I did remember it. And I managed to track this teacher down guy called mr yabakum and i, I and I, I i went to his rotary club meeting online a zoom rotary club meeting to talk about it he's long retired he ended up a vicar and retired and everything but it was really great so my, my i've gone one way off the point as always but you are quite right uh, whilst i was a cop i was too busy because working in i mean you probably you've seen the evidence of this when mm. You, you've you come in, no doubt, as a duty solicitor when someone's been nicked on a surveillance job or on a major job and you've got a major crime team there and you can see the state of them because all the cops are all going to be like falling to bits because they've not had any hours off. They've been, you know, they've been working all the hours God sent. And I was doing that all the time for years and years and years. I was working mental mad hours and I didn't have pause time to pause. I, I My life was consumed by commuting or working and so yeah i i didn't have the mental capacity or the space in order to write but i had kept on reading you know during the commutes i'd read so yeah i i think it all comes down to the reading and then when i retired i found myself with time and space to breathe and that's when i thought i'd give it a shot yeah i always say there's always some kind of pivot in your life when you've had a previous career that then creates the space because mine was when I took redundancy and I took redundancy and then I became self-employed as a solicitor and because I was I was now in control of my time and how the hours and the days I chose to work I was then able to find the space to actually sit down and write a book and actually think about it because when you're working you know it's like when you're working full-time and you're working on these cases I always say you know the difference between me and you you're there from day one <laughs> from day dot, from the minute the suspect is identified and then you're building this case. And then it's kind of like, it's then handed over. You hand it over to the CPS. Then I get my version of it to prepare for the defense. And then we start bu building the case from that point. But it's all consuming. Like there's no space yeah. for anything else. Yeah. I mean, some people manage it. I mean, your friend and my friend, Tony Kent, I is a how. busy... I mean, he is a properly busy barrister yeah. defending at the very top end of crime. And he still manages to knock a book out every year. And I, I have no idea how he, how he manages the, men, the mental space for it. And he's knocking out brilliant thrillers, we know, sort of one a year on average. And he still yeah. manages. I couldn't have done it because my brain was full to the brim or, or I was always tired. So, yeah, it is, it's exactly that. I needed the, the mental space and it, I needed it. And I took a year, probably two years 
just doing nothing really apart you have from to recover the- from it don't you i just need it and i also needed to i think i needed to sort of realize because again we all the same you think i'd like i want to write a book i want to write a book i want to write a book but you never you're not convinced you'll ever be able to do it because it seems before you've done it it seems like this pipe dream this almost unimaginable that, that you would be able to do it and then you do it and you think i can do it i actually you can do it and then you write a book and you sell a few copies and then obviously i then went on and there was a bit of a damascene moment which i'll tell you about which made me start writing the currencies series it was the, the, the max craigie series which is obviously we share a publisher i i i was it was christmas it was the christmas before lockdown 2019 and I was, uh, we were with some friends at a big, lovely house in the Highlands. And there was an old guy there who told me the story. I, told, I always tell this story. And he'd spent most of his life in Australia, but he was back over and he was a proper Scot. His accent hadn't diminished at all. And he said, I've got, and he knew as a writer. And he says, I've got to tell you this story because I think there's something in it. And maybe you could use it in a book. And you know what it has. You, you, have, you know, Nads, you get people <laughs> who tell you that. And you think, oh, this is going to be crap. Because mostly <laughs> they are. People tell you they're a great idea for a, for a story. And, and you just humour them. <laughs> you do. So I listened, but he was a really nice bloke, and we were getting on famously. And he said, it was in the 1960s, he goes, and I was researching my wife's family. He used to be a police officer himself before he emigrated to Australia. He goes, and I went to this graveyard in the wilds of, you know, of the highlands in Caithness. This, he goes, and it was barren. There was nothing there, but there was this walled graveyard this abandoned he goes just dry stone walls everything was falling down i had to like clear all the undergrowth away to get through the gate i then was clearing away some of the gravestones so i could see what was on them and i cleared away one on the ground and it just said this grave never to be opened and i thought what and he goes that's got to be something you can use in a book and i'm like of course you're right as head i can see your face as well that's yeah. like, oh my god that's cool. That's really cool. This grave, no date on it, no name, nothing. Just this grave never to be opened. Literally those words. And then it just got me thinking, like, what, why? And what, I, you know, and I did a bit of asking around and I asked some people because it sounded like the sort of thing someone might have used in a book. Mm. And I asked some people that I know, you know, and I said, have you, people who are in the, well in the writing game, I said, have you heard anybody deploying it? And they all said, well, no, but Christ, if you don't, I will. And I said, well, no, no, I've patented it. So I then thought, how do I, how do I then deploy this? How do I deploy it? And I thought, well, it feels historical, but I'm not a historical writer. I'm far too lazy to do the research. I thought, and I'm not writing about a pandemic because by the time <laughs> I you know, was really thinking about it, we COVID had hit. And I thought, well, how can I use it in a contemporary crime thriller that's going to play to my strengths as an ex detective and all this sort of thing? So I came up with the idea of the D.S. Max Craigie novel and about how the grave would form part of the story about a feud from 1830, when I thought about this grave would be, that comes to life in the modern day. And that's where the Max Craigie series was born, out of that one flash of inspiration that a half-cut old guy told me <laughs> at a big house in Pit Lockery. And I then took a, a, ch- a chance and I got came up with the idea for it, got myself an agent just on just on the idea and i wrote the book and then i i got a publishing deal really quickly with with hq who we are both published by yeah did that surprise and, and you when all that when it happened you know that quickly i knew it was a good book you know what i mean sometimes mm. you write something and you're not sure sometimes you write something and you think this is i think this is a good book i think this is a good story and i, I really really think there's something here and i mean i ended up with a couple of offers and i went with hq predominantly because they were part of Harper Collins and you know we've all got the big five dream haven't we but yeah the editor at the who acquired me was Finn a guy called Finn Cotton who was just fabulous the scumbag then moved after two more books <laughs> and now he, he did now, move. he is lovely though <laughs> he is a really great guy and he's now getting promoted and flying up the you know he's at Transworld and you know editorial director and all that sort of stuff but I'm you know very thankful to him and then it was just easy to write more. It was just easy because, you know, I, what I found is I created a cast of characters and managed to chuck a load of humour into it and make it funny to me anyway. I think it's funny. And, you know, that's... the And, and they've sold 
really, really well. Um, oh, they have spoke you, very well, haven't they? I'll tell you a secret because I've only just learned. Yeah, the time it's this such goes a out. secret. <laughs> it is such a secret, but I just sold over a quarter of a million of them. So not bad. <laughs> it's not bad, is it? Quarter of a million books, and so I'm obviously really delighted with that. And then I got another contract to write three more, which I've done. I've written all of those, and I'm writing some more. So yeah, it's it's ended up being a proper life and a proper job from something that I didn't really ever take that seriously. What was it like? What was it like? You know, that transition from being with a small indie press, or was it burning chair? And then moving to, you said you moved to the big, one of the big fives. Were you like aware of that? Yeah, it, like felt yeah. it felt different. It felt different. The editing process, I don't want to disrespect the, what the edits, but the, the difference between an editor who's where it's their full time job, where they're, they've been doing it a long time, where they're fantastic at it, where they are supremely gifted at it was different from working with a couple of guys who have got a lot of respect for. And you know, the, um, the, the Novak series are sold well, bearing in mind a small and it still sells well and I get great reviews, but it, it was a different process in terms of the mechanics of getting from it felt obviously it. Yeah. You're, you become part of a, of a big organization in terms of cover design, in terms of the audiobook production, in terms of the advertising strategies, the marketing strategies. You also get your books in bookshops, which is, again, a big difference because, you know, it's hard to get when you're with a very small press that nearly or only publishes really through Amazon. Obviously, you know, the bookshops aren't interested, but I, I had, again, a couple of more strokes of luck in the the first of the Craigie books, Dead Man's Grave, was long listed for the McIlvanny Prize, which really made HQ sit up and think, oh, hang on, do we need to really get behind this? And the, then they really started pushing me. They put me into hardback. They did decent, solid print runs of the of the paperback. It was M. Waterstone's Scottish Book of the Month at the end of the first year which meant it sold a load in, in Waterstones. And then really, really got me in with all the booksellers because all the booksellers were, you know, certainly in Scotland, all the booksellers really liked it. And I also discovered the secret with making booksellers really like your books, which is to go to them, say thank you, and then give them cake. <laughs> you give them cake. <laughs> they love you for it. They're great people, honestly. And I, I owe the booksellers a, a huge amount. So then I found myself in this thing where, people are starting to get excited about books and you know that's fantastic that's you know it's a dream come true it's a dream come true it's an eye-opener isn't it though when you've come in when you first come into the industry and I'm not just talking about just coming into it from indie to traditionally big one of the big five but when you just come into it moving from a reader and then moving into a writer and then seeing how the entire machine works and, you know, you, you know, it happened quickly for you and you had all these amazing things happen to you. But then you have to explain to people outside how all these things, they're not really even like normal because it's like it's hard to get into the bookshops. It's hard it to get into the supermarkets. Brilliant. It's hard to go from digital print, then and move over to hardback. Like you think these are just automatic things when you're just a reader. Well, you, you become obviously. You know, you, you meet lots of writers because of course we go to festivals and all that sort of thing. We all knock mm. about together and have beers together. And you know that not everyone has the same experience. And I, I do thank my lucky stars that, that everything aligned to put me in. You know, there's a load of luck. You know, ask Ian Rankin about it. He said, what are the big things you need to become a successful author? He says, you've got to get lucky and you've got to stay lucky. And that's very true. And I got lucky because I got the right editor at the right time. I became Scottish Book of the Month at Waterstones because one bookseller in Glasgow loved it and really loved it. And he went to the boss of Waterstones in Scotland and said, I think you should make this Scottish Book of the Month. And he did. And that really, because they say, and the book, you go and see the booksellers, and they say a Scottish based thriller, gritty old Scottish crime book is going to sell if you make it book of the month and then everyone starts getting interested when you start selling a lot of paperbacks and you know it starts but not everyone has the same experience you know we all you know we all we've all got lots of friends who are with all different publishers and even if you're with 
a big five publisher, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be having the same experience. And, you know, it, it, it can be tricky for some people and it can get quite demoralizing. But, you know, you ride your luck, don't you? You ride your luck yeah. and you don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Did you ever have any any doubts or imposter syndrome? Because one thing I've, like I say, noticed or, or common theme when I've spoken to other writers who've had other careers is that I always say you can be so sure of yourself in your previous career. You know, you spend years in it, decades in it. You know your way around it. You could do it with your eyes closed. And then you move into this new career and there's a moment of doubt. Did you ever have that? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. But I think the thing is, I I didn't go into it with any expectations. Mm. Beyond the first thing was just, can I write a book? Can I write a book? That's the thing. Can I do this thing? Can I can I write a book that other people might want to read? That's point one. First one is just, can I finish a book? Can I finish a story that makes sense? And then it's, can I write a book that other people want to read? And then, of course, we don't get satisfied, do we? We're never really satisfied. Because even though, you know, I've sold 250,000 books. That's fantastic. Not enough, but I want to sell more. Because <laughs> you, you want people to read the book. And yeah, okay, it's nice that, you know, you start making a couple of quid out of it. But the reality is what's really exciting, it is exciting, is when people come up to you and tell you, oh, I love your books, you know. I really, I'm loving it. It's great. I want to... I want to hear what's happening to your characters next. And what was it? One of my favorite reviews. And it wasn't from another one. It was just, a, I think it was just a Amazon review or something. And someone said, when I open a Neil Lancaster book for the first time, it's like meeting up with old friends. And I thought, oh, God, I really like that. That'd because, nice. well, because I put the effort I put in, and I think the stories are good. I'm proud of the stories and the plots. I'm proud of the plots. And I think they're intricate and they're twisty and all that sort of stuff. But I'd be, I've become so attached to the people in the books and the, and the characters. I love writing them. I really like them. And even the ones that are horrible, I really like them. I love writing about them. They're great fun to write these horrible, evil villains. And these, I mean, I don't go to your depths of. <laughs> I'm not that awful. <laughs> oh, your books are, oh, blimey. I mean, the Jigsaw Man. Oh, my giddy. <laughs> cracking book, mate. Cracking book. But God, it's Thank you. brutal. It's gruesome. <laughs> But yeah. Wait for the next one. <laughs> oh God, yeah, I think I think I'm getting one, aren't I? I do hope so. Yeah, I think I've I think I have asked for. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we've all look. We all have self doubt, and sometimes when you go, and for, I mean, look, here's here's a, here's a way to make yourself feel like an imposter. Last year, I was on stage on an in, an in conversation with Mark Billingham for an hour and a half. You think, crikey, you know. I was reading Mark Billingham books thinking these are great and, it, you know, it'd be, it'd be nice to be, you know, one ten. And then I'm on stage sat next to him, you know. I'm doing a, I'm doing an event in April locally to here with Ian Rankin. Hey, hey, crikey, that's, you know, yeah, that that's is something. That's testament to you though, isn't it? Well, look, you, you, it, you look, have to look at yourself and be like, I deserve to be here. Well, I do think the books are good. I Honestly, I, I do think they're good. And, you know, my... My wife tells me she likes them, so that's good enough for me. And <laughs> you know, family keep telling you they're good. I mean, family always tell you tell you they're good. You know, family want to like yeah. them, don't they? But when you look and I think, crikey, you know, lots of people do seem to like these books. It you start getting a little bit of confidence. I think is the other thing. You when you when you start a book, when I finish it, I think I think this is okay. I think I'm pretty chuffed with this book now. I, I think I have less less self doubt. But then I can talk to other writers way more successful ones than me. And they'll say, when I finished a book, I'm convinced it's crap. Maybe it's arrogant of me, but I think I am at a stage where now, where, I'm, where am I now? I mean, I've written one, two, three, uh, what is it coming out? I'm just looking at the pile of them over there. <laughs> There's five, I've got... I uh, have it's seven. Be eight. Yeah, it's going to be eight. Okay. It's, it's going to be eight next month because my, my, my fifth Max Craigie, The Devil You Know, comes out next month. I've written number six. That's in edit at the moment. So, yeah, so I, I start to think, I think at the end of them, and then you have your doubt and you think, ah, oh, but I do think it's good. I do think it's good. And then when you get it back from your editor saying, oh, I love it. And then you, you get your structural edit and you start looking into that. And then it's great. And you think, oh, crikey, you know, they give some good solid advice around what, how it can be improved and, you know, sorting out some of the motivations and things like that. 
So I, I personally, I think I've got a little bit more confident in the fact that I can do it. But then whilst I'm writing it, I still have my moments thinking, I mean, I'm writing number seven at the moment and I'm about what, 25% of the way through and I'm at the, it's a bit crap moment, <laughs> even though I know there's some good stuff in it. I, I was with that. that. Yeah, I was with that. I was right. I had to stop writing book four because I had to, I had to do a proofread of book three. So I had to stop. But it took me so long to get into the flow of book four. And I was funny, I was saying it to Finn Cotton last week. It's like I didn't know what to do. I had these two characters. I had Palacia and the DS Eastwood. And I had them at New Scotland Yard. And you know Westminster Pier? It's like across the road. Yeah. So I I had them there. I did not know what to do with them, Neil. Like <laughs> I, I have a plan and I had no idea. I'm like, what am I doing with these characters? Where are they going? And I said to Finn, I literally stuck them on the river bus. And I sent them back up to Greenwich. And I was like, once I put them on the bus, on the river bus, sent them up to Greenwich, I was like, okay, now I know what I'm doing with you. But I literally had to put them somewhere and have them move in because they were sitting on the page for like a week. I was like, how <laughs> get them to move <laughs> until I put them on the river bus? Well, I, I never know what's happening. I, honestly, I, I, I don't plan anything. I haven't got, I mean, I've got a whiteboard that I wrote some notes up there, which I wrote some notes on for Craigie 7. Honestly, it's just like the worst spider graph, not very big. I wrote it a number of weeks ago and I haven't looked at it since. I, it's in there, but I don't look at it. There's nothing there. Yeah. I literally have to find the story out as I go. And it takes me ages to write the first half of the book. Well, not ages, but, you know, comparing. Get into it. Ages. Yeah. Once I'm in, then I can really fly. And I, I'm starting to get into this, the one I'm writing now. I'm starting to get into it. The, it the, I've got some new characters in there and, you know, some of the extra new cops that I'll bring in building up the bad guys and where's the jeopardy and all that sort of thing. But yeah, no, we all get that. I mean, Ian Rankin, yeah, I think will, tell you, Ian Rankin will tell you that he'll get to 15, 16, 17,000, 20 to 20,000 words. And he says his wife will say to him, he'll walk downstairs and say, oh, I did it. this isn't working. And she'll <laughs> say, you always say this and you always say it at this particular moment. And then he gets back on with it and finishes the book. That's just the way it goes. I think, I don't think there's one writer who will say anything different. The same thing. So I'm sitting there, so these two characters outside New Scotland Yard, and I'm like, this is crap. This is rubbish. I don't know. I don't know what the point of this is. And you have that moment. And then you, you have them, you know, you force them to do something. You're like, oh, yeah, I've worked out what's going on now. And yeah. then you just have to get over that initial hump. And aren't they the great moments? I think they're the great moments. They, they're, they're sometimes the, th the bits where I think, hey, this is really worth it. This is really great. Yeah. When you solve a plot point, I remember going back, let's go back to the blood type. I was near the halfway point of the book. And the crux of the book is, I mean, maybe a bit of a spoiler, but it doesn't matter. But I'm sort of halfway through the book and, and there's these couple of corrupt NCA agents. And they were going to be the sort of the driving villains for it. Yeah. And... Then I thought, I don't know, I feel like the book needs something. I need to wake the, I need to wake the reader up. I need to make the reader have a WTF, a WTF moment. And I thought, what happens if I kill them? I wonder what would happen if I kill them. And I asked a, somebody, who, a friend who is, you know, a decent writer, but is good with the structure and how, how the mechanics mm. of writing a book, which I have no clue about, you know, about whether it's three act, four act, five act, snowflake method all that i don't know any of that and i said to her I, i've got this and i'm thinking of doing this i'm thinking i might just kill these two and see where it takes me and she said well where are you in the book i goes, i'm about halfway she goes midpoint twist do it yeah, and i did and it worked so well it worked so well but before then that wasn't the book i was planning it, it turned into a totally different book but i, think and that, I love and I it think, i think you you and you have to run with those moments because you know me, I said, I plan out my books, but there, there's so many moments in, I think, all the books I've written so far, there are subplots which I did not plan for. And when they've come up while I, when I've been writing them, I've had that, you said, the WTF moment. And I was like, what, what, what is this? <laughs> like, where has this come from? But then you just go, no, okay, it, it's there. Yeah, just go with it. And they have worked. They've been the best moments. Yeah, I, I, that's, that's when it's exciting. And that's, that's when it's fun. And that, you know, that, that's when it's really, really good fun. Neil, can I ask you a question, right? Going back to your policing days. Yeah. You know, I think it's something, it's a common question that we both get, 
which is that, you know, how do you like not take your work home? Like, how do you separate yourself? But then I was thinking, I remember being in Belgravia police station this is years, years ago, like three o'clock in the morning. And I'm going there to represent my client. And my client's got serious mental health issues, really violent. And I remember one of the police officers saying to me, like, I'm going to stand outside the door. And I'm like, I'm going to be fine. And he's like, no, he's dangerous. I'm going to be outside the door. And I said, but I don't, I know I'm not in danger. And I was thinking, were there a moment when you were in dangerous situations, but you didn't feel that you were in danger? I don't know, really, because these, these things can turn on a sixpence. And mm. obviously, you know, being a police officer, for most of the people you're encountering, you're the kind of the bad guy as far as they're concerned. There were some times where I thought you could see it and you could see it in someone's eyes. They were yeah. being very threatening. They were posturing. They were flexing. But I could see it in their eyes that they didn't mean it. I could see it in their eyes that they weren't going to carry through with it. But you've still got to be on your guard. Yeah. I, I Yeah, there were times I was scared. I'm not going to lie. There was plenty of times I was scared. But they, they don't live with me. I don't remember those. They're the things that you asked me to remember about those times. And there was once or twice. Where yeah, it was very hairy, but they don't. I don't sit and get the shakes, or I don't give those any thought. There are things that live with me to this day. You talk about taking your work home with you. Yeah, sometimes, absolutely, I did. There are still things today. There are things I can't talk about today, not because of being mm. sick or anything like that. Because I mean, one of them it may it make me well up if I even talk about it. I'm not over it, and because you come across, you don't just come across scary stuff. You come across incredibly sad stuff, heartbreaking. Yeah, and. There are things I, I won't get over. And uh, not many, mostly it's okay. But it's funny what the brain filters out. It's it, it's funny what memories will sit and you will not shake off. I, I'll give you a quick example. I was posted with one particular cop. This one was a uniform cop. I was posted with a uniform cop. We used to post together for a month if you were driving one particular vehicle. So you sort of like, build up a bit of teamwork and all that. It was a really, really hectic, busy month. And Cops deal with a lot of death because people die all the time. You know, people are being born all the time. People are dying all the time. If someone dies, generally a cop goes, even if it's not suspicious. We got called to a premises by a guy who said, I was out with my mate last night and we drank a stupid amount and I can't raise him. I, I can't, I'm knocking on the door and he won't answer. And he never, you know, he, so I said, all right, well, we'll get in. So I managed to get in, climb through the, the window. He was dead. Only a young lad in his 20s. He'd basically, they'd drunk themselves to death. He'd drunk himself to death, literally downed a bottle of whiskey. And he was lying, spoiler alert for anybody, because it, it's, I'm going to just talk about a dead body. He was lying on in like the fetal position on, yeah. on the bed. And he wasn't, like, you know, it wasn't gruesome or anything like that. But then obviously we have to search the body and all that sort of stuff to make sure there's no injuries or anything obvious like that. Anyway, didn't appear to be that. And then the undertakers came along to move it. And they said, look, can you give us a hand? Now, rigor mortis had set in. So he's in this fetal position. So we had to pick him up to put him into the body bag. And his like, hands, I'm describing it, but his hands were like by his face. And they, everything stayed in the same position. We had to put him in no. and zip him into, the, zip him into the body bag. Now, that was a clean body. It, he hadn't been sick particularly. I mean, he, he hadn't soiled himself. It wasn't gruesome in the way that I've seen some horrendously gruesome ones. But it, it stuck with me and it disturbed me because he was so young and because of it's just the mental image that I had of it. And I was talking to this guy many years later, like decades later, and I was talking to him about, about it. And I said, do you remember that body? And I talked and recounted the story. And he goes, well, yeah, I do vaguely, he goes, but I'm surprised that's what you take away from that week. And I said, why? He goes, do you not remember the place we went into in Wilston Green where a bloke had an axe in his head? And I went, I'd forgotten about that. And I know you're laughing and it is funny. I know, because, I shouldn't laugh though, but... I know, no, but it is funny because it, what's, it's not, I mean, obviously they both were horrible. It's not horrible. Events. Yeah. But what got me is the far less gruesome, dramatic, horrible one stuck with me. Where's the guy with literally an axe in his head I'd forgotten about? And that just struck me, you know, that some things, and it's not necessarily the gruesome, unpleasant. And I've seen, you know, I've been into three-month-old bodies. I've, I, I've, you know, people with dreadful injuries, you know. I, I mean, the worst one that I still cannot, I really struggle to talk about was a cot death. 
And I can't talk about it. It was at Christmas in 1997. I remember it like it was yesterday. And I, I struggle to talk about it. I think about it every, every year at Christmas. I will cry about this. And it's, it's horrendous. And, but, you know, and, and then I, I get angry with myself because why, why should I, you know, I, I, I didn't lose anybody. What about these poor people? Christmas will never be the same. So, so much does come home with you as a cop. And I'm sure it can be the same as a solicitor because you deal in terrible tragedy. It's just not tragedy in the same way. You're you're looking at perhaps a young man in front of you who's got himself into a terrible situation because of his background, because of what's happened to him, because of the trauma in his own background. He's got involved in something and someone's dead on the pavement. That little lad is now looking at 25, 26, 27 years in prison. People go on about jail sentences need to be longer. Jail sentences are way too long. There's too many people in prison. People, you know, you're getting a kid committing a crime at 18 years of age, getting weighed off for 30 years now. That never used to happen. Average sentences used to be, what, 16, 17 years? 16. It was, I was talking about this before I spoke to you. I was talking to someone. I was giving them legal advice for their book. And I was saying, like, back in 2008, 2009, when I had 17-year-olds getting convicted of murder, they were getting life sentences. But the tariffs were only, like, 16, 17 years. Now, fast forward to now, where were we, 2024? 28, 28 years? Yeah, easy. So imagine for a 17-year-old. And I think, yeah. like I said, cases stay with me differently as a solicitor. Because I said, I get it. You know, you deal with from day one. Then it's all packaged up and handed over to me. But then said, so the cases that probably might not affect me. I mean, I wasn't going home crying about it. But the ones where I would say to the 17-year-old kid, you've got my personal number, not just my work number. I've given you my personal number because I'm scared for you. And I need you to call me in case something, you, you find yourself in a situation, I need to know that you can get through to me. Those are the cases that stuck for me. The ones where I was scared for them because I may be like, okay, I've got you out of this situation. You know, you've been given a chance, but the way your life circumstances are, your home, people you're associating yourself with, you're a good kid, but I can see it only going one way. Yeah, and those were the yeah, and those were the ones that life yeah. mapped out. I I do talks. I do life some talks for schools. I I do some talks for schools about being a writer, but I always equate it to my former occupation. And I give a case study, an example for a, a young lad called Jamal Moore. Now I was dealing with Jamal Moore when I was a uniform cop when I first joined up, and I really liked him. He was a great lad. He was a real good. He was a good laugh. He was funny, and I you know he was he was thirteen year old and whatever. But then as he grew up, he got drawn into crime. Now, his mother was a crack dealer. His dad was inside for life. His brother was an armed robber. And his life was mapped out. And the the inevitable thing happened. He got murdered. He got Mm. murdered. He got involved in crime. And people were saying, you know, cops can be really, really, really quite cruel sometimes. And they can say, oh, well, he played big boys games. He, You know, big boys rules. Fine. Fuck about. Find out. All this sort of thing you hear about now. And I could, I said, no, what chance did he have? His life was mapped out for him. He was a good lad with a, with, with a decent upbringing, with decent parents. He could have gone wherever he wanted because he was dead smart. And, you know, so, so yeah, there's tragedy everywhere. And it's not the obvious places. It's not always yeah. in the obvious places. Jamal was objectively a bad man at that time. But you only have to scratch the surface to see that life ain't fair. You know, I don't yeah. come from privilege. I grew up on a council estate, but I had two parents who cared deeply about me. And I had a, so I had a really great example about how to live my life. He didn't have that. And, and I think that's an absolute tragedy. And that lives with me. Things like that live with me. Because I had to go and see it. I saw that's Jamal Moore. People didn't know who he was dead on the floor. And I goes, I know who that is. That's Jamal Moore. I like Jamal. You know, and it, it was just, they're the things. I, they, they still live with me. Yeah, the kids. I say, for me, it's, it's always the kids. I can deal with, I've sat in the room with murderers. <laughs> like if, if the worst, I would say the worst of society I've sat in the room of and I've had to represent. But the kids are the ones I would get. I would get angry with them as well. But the anger wasn't like, it was like a parent getting angry. It wasn't angry like, I can't believe I've got to do with this. It's like, I can't believe that I don't want to see your life go this way. So I'm doing whatever it, I can to get you to just turn the other way. It is honestly, and it's such a tragedy that. I mean, the, the race plays an enormous part in this, doesn't it? Because I, I don't know what it is because people go on about stop and search and there's, look, there's lots and there's lots of arguments that can be had for and against it. 
But the problem is we've got a real problem with young black kids killing other black kids. You know, black kids are committing a lot of stabbings, but black kids are being stabbed at a horrible rate, and I don't know what we do about it. And it's a tragedy. I don't even understand it. Like, when I think, I know, you know, you know, like when, you always look back at your youth and you always think it was like, God, it was only like 10 years ago. And then you realise actually, no, it was a lot. It was a much longer right, period yeah, of like, time. Certainly for me. Crikey. Yeah, like it was really, it was a long time ago. <laughs> but you're looking back at your youth and I'm always thinking, I remember the gangs and stuff that were around when I was growing up. And I remember the fights that would go on when I was growing up. But I don't remember this prevalence of knives being around. And I, maybe I'm romanticising it a bit, but maybe I'm like, I'm mean, thinking when there were fights, they used okay, they used weapons, but it wasn't knives. There's a base oh, and there's this, there's the big, that. The big point is now it's the difference between now and then is back then if it was a knife, it was a knife they got from their mum's knife block. Now yeah, it's a zombie true. knife. It's a machete. And the fact is mm. a st- one stab from a a kitchen knife, a six inch kitchen or a, a four inch kitchen blade, all right, you still do a, a big chance of getting killed. But it's a lot less than if someone stabs you with a 12-inch zombie knife. Mm. So there are changes, and God knows it's, you know, I'm, I, I feel, for, and I feel for many of these kids because, I, you know, what, what is it? Look, we could talk about this all day. <laughs> no, I'm watching the clock. And, and I'm like, and the thing is, we are on the same, it. we're on the total same page about it, Nads. I tell you, I can promise you that. Yeah. I can tell you a nice moment, though, I had as a solicitor, one of the kids I was telling off. Because I'm like, I do not. He got the warning, but like, I do not want to be turning on BBC London News and seeing your name. Like, I, I, I don't. I, like, I can't deal with that. And about so we did this case. And he was up for GBH Section 18, and it was a, it was a stabbing. He was in a house with friends, and there's a girl involved. And it was just, it was so. I say it was ridiculous, but it's one of those when he should have left, and he didn't leave. He stayed, and a stabbing happened. And I did his trial, and he got acquitted. And I was so grateful. But we've been, all the time I was going to see him at Felton and I'm giving him the warnings. I'm like, you're young. He was 18. I'm like, you're young. You can turn things around. You've never been in trouble before. This is not you. I know this is not you. And about, so he was 18. So about four years later, about four or five years later, I'm at work. And I get, first I get a package arrive, get sent to my office address. And it's a painting. And then I get an email from him. And he was like, Nadine, I don't know if you remember me. I've sent you this painting because I know if you don't remember that I used to paint, I've sent you this picture. And he goes, I want you to remember and know that I listened to everything you said and I'm just going to be graduating from uni and I've got my degree in business. That's the only time I've cried. (laughs) Oh, man, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I'm well enough myself here. What a lovely story. And isn't that something to be proud of, though? Isn't that something to be proud of? I think that's the one thing I'm... Yeah, I'm proud of that. All the, you know, all the acquittals you, I've got over the God knows how many years and stuff. It's like, that's the moment I'm proud of, that he was able to email me and send me a picture five years later telling me and he listened. life could have been so different, couldn't could it? Could have been so much different. So much different. So that's one of the things I'm very, I'm very, very proud. You should be very moment. proud of that. You should, you should be very proud of that. Neil, should we talk about your new book? Because I feel like all we right, could be yeah. sitting there all day. I forgot. I forgot we, we could. We always talk too much when we're together, aren't we? These we are always say festivals. Yeah, the, my next book is called The Devil You Know, and it's coming out on the 28th of March. It's, it is about, I'm trying to think what it is about. I always forget because <laughs> you never quite know where you are in the sort of, in, in, the, in the publishing schedule. I do know what this is about. This is, this is about, a woman called Beata, who is a Polish sex worker who ostensibly goes missing six years previously. In fact, she's been murdered. She's been murdered on the orders of someone who desperately wants her shut up because she can ruin his life. And the one of the repeating villains from the book are the Hardy family. And Davy Hardy, who is currently in jail, offers to help the police to track down the body of Beata. And the theme of the book is, can you trust a killer to help you catch a killer? So I, there was a couple of themes I wanted to explore on this. I'm very interested in the subject of missing persons because initially Beata is being treated as a missing person. And why do some missing persons dominate the headlines? I'm talking about Nicola Bully, for instance. 
And why do some, let's look at the figures. We just look at the figures on missing persons. I've been researching it for a, hopefully a newspaper feature I want to write. I think it's like 190,000 people go missing every year. Now, most of them come back within hours. Many more come back within a few days. But of these, just look at the figures, go online and see how many are never seen again. Why do they not get the attention? And why do some get the attention? Now, we can make all sorts of things about what they look like. You know, Madeleine McCann, for instance, obviously a very attractive family, a very beautiful young girl. Nicola Bully, a middle-aged woman with kids who just disappeared for no apparent reason. I can see why it fires the information. The, that one does. But why do some others not? Why? Why do they not? And it struck me that someone like Beata Dabrowski, who had got, who's gone missing in this book, why, wouldn't, why would she not attract attention? Well, because she's somebody who falls between the cracks. She's not someone that would emote a great deal of public sympathy. And I was interested to explore that. And obviously, corruption plays a large part of it, as often happens in my books. Not necessarily always about police. But that's it. It's a, it's a story of something that's happened six years previously. And there are people who desperately do not want her found and desperately want anybody connected to this case to not be able to say what's happened. So it's a, again, it's a conspiracy th theory. And I'm really, really pleased with it. I think I'm really, really pleased with it. I can't wait for it to come out. I think it's really, it's really, it's, this is the exciting bit, isn't it? That's where you think I've written a book and I know this is the good one. And the, the net galley reviews are the best I've had. I've got about 50 reviews so far. Uh, hopefully I'll get to about 200 by the time it, it's out. And they're overwhelmingly five stars. So I, I'm dead excited about this one coming out. Can't it makes it worth it. You know, when you start seeing the reviews come in and it's before yeah. general publication, you're like, yeah. yes, I made the right decision. This was the right yeah. story. Attempt. And then, you, you know, you get, some, you get some writers that you really admire. I mean, Helen Fields has given me a wonderful blurb. Mike Craven's given me a wonderful blurb. And loads of others. And so, yeah, you start getting some confidence up in, in the book. Mm. Obviously, you know, the, the publishers, my editor's really excited about it. And it, it's, it's really, really, I'm looking forward to seeing it out there and seeing what people think. It's interesting, you know, you're talking like the missing people. missing pe Yeah, missing people. And I, I can't remember if it was the Jigsaw Man or the Binding Room, but I remember having to look at the figures for missing people. And I think back then, it was, it might have been the Jigsaw Man, so this might have been like 2018, 2016, 2018. And the figures were, I think it was like 140,000. Might be less, like yeah. less than that. Now, you know, it's gone up. And as you're saying, out of, so let's, let's say 190,000 people going missing. And if you look at over the course of the year, only three or four of them are going to be the ones who make the newspapers and the exactly. TV. Mm -hmm. And there's no, I can't, there's no, there's not, it's not like there's an algorithm in play the, the, Just, some really garner public attention yet others don't and we we could make also you know who who do the public identify with i mean then we've also got i mean i haven't gone into this side of it the whole i mean nicola nicola bully was a terrible example of the british public wasn't it with and the people who think they understand police investigations and people who think they know what they're talking people think they understood what was going on with massive theories about what had happened to her and I can remember people shouting online going, the police have done an awful job. They've not done this. They've not done that. And I'd go on and I'd say, where are you getting that information from? Because the police ain't telling you that. They're not giving running commentary on what they're doing. How do you know? Well, I know because, yeah, but how do you know? Tell me the source that led you to that opinion. And it turns out they saw it on YouTube. And yeah. this is the thing. Everyone thinks they're a bloody expert now. And it really gets on my nerves. I you know? tried. I work really hard. Do not respond to anything I see on social media from it's anyone who starts. Yeah, from anyone who starts off their comment with, "I'm not a lawyer," but oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, there was even someone yesterday, and it was a it was my, it was so minor, and it was like I don't like when. Well, clearly this person doesn't know about police procedure and technique because they keep referring to SOCO, which is senior crime officers, as CSI, and I'm like. Do you think realize like now in 2020, even before that, it's, That's pretty it's, it's kind of been, yeah, it's pretty common now. And it's been kind of like, it's kind of been kind of like phasing out from Soko to yeah, CSI. I mean, 
It's... Like, people have asked me that because people ask me sort of say, what is it, SOCO or CSI? And I say, well, you're not wrong. If you say yeah. whichever one, it, you're not wrong because there are still plenty of people. Or if I was going to do it, I would actually use that if I had it in a book. I would use that for to separate the opinions of older cops and younger cops because a lot of your older I... cops will still say SOCO. Your younger ones would all say CSI. Well, there's a to me, there's a point and an opportunity for a bit of banter out of that. Yeah. I've done so, both. Yeah. In, yeah, I think even in the kill list, because I've been proofreading, like I know if they've been referred to as both. But I mean, I know that's like a little minor point, but there's but there's been more serious things than what you're oh, yeah. saying about, you know, these so so called experts, mm. you know, giving their opinion. And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, but where have you got that information from? And this information is wrong. And you see all the people liking and commenting on their comment, you know, agreeing with them. And then this false narrative is built. And then it just mushrooms. And And then you get amateur detectives turning up at the scene, getting in the blooming way. There's a book in that, you know. There is a book. There is a book in that. There's a book. You and I are like that. There is a book in that around... You, you know, because some of your, I mean, I obviously I do a bit of true crime TV, but some of your true crime obsessives are a bit scary. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but they, you know what? They were, even, I know we're going off on a tangent, but they were even around, even before true crime podcasts became a thing, because they were around, but not to the extent that they are now. But you would no, still no, have these awful. amateur, I sound really offensive, but really these amateur detectives giving their opinion the amount of trials i've done where a jurors had to be dismissed because oh. they've been doing their research on oh, facebook awful. online and they've come back and told the other jurors about yeah the no, fact yeah, that yeah, no. Think, yeah i had one of my clients but you know with bad character you know you're not supposed to know about your client's previous the defendant's previous convictions and they've gone and done i have no idea how they found out they found out and they went and told the other jurors but lucky, you know, you social always have media, one set. Sir? Social, gen- media. Is, social media is a genuine threat to a fair trial, I would say. A yeah. genuine threat to a fair trial. I anyway, that is it. another point. We're going way <laughs> off the point. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I have two questions before I go off to our four. This is the end of the interview questions. But I'm okay. going to follow through. Was there anything that you learned in your, I'm saying 35 years of policing, that prepared <laughs> you for your awful life? And I don't mean the, like, the stuff you learn and you're able to put in your books. I just mean in terms of being an officer and being in whatever situation that prepared you for being an author. I, I, there is, actually. And I tell you what, I, I've spoken to this about, you. we're both, again, friends with Imran Mahmood and Tony Kent, mm. both great writers and great barristers. When I get edits, I have this burning urge to do them. And it's because I just need to get them done. If they're there, yeah. I've got this list of things to do. I have to get it done. And I've worked out why it is, and it'll be the same for lawyers. When I was a cop, you do a big job. You have to set all the stuff up. You're doing surveillance operation, and you're following somebody around, and you're doing all this sort of stuff you've got to do. And then you have a strike. You take the guy, guy out, doing whatever he's doing. You take him back to the police station. You've then got a very limited amount of time to get that paperwork and everything sorted, ready to get yep. to the CPS, ready for a charge, ready for it. And then you've got your court trial to prepare for. You've got to get this done. You cannot hang around because we've all got time. You've got custody time limits. You've got that. So when I get an edit, an, an edit, I have to get it done. I hear people saying, oh, I've got my structural edit. It, it took me three months. So it's got three months. It'll take me, th- it's more likely to take me three days tops. I'm not hanging about. I will literally, I just have to get it done. I can't, I cannot leave it behind. I don't know, Imran said the same. He got, he got a line edit back and it, it took him, it was hours. Never mind it. Because that's what you do as a lawyer, isn't it? You, you go to court, you take a load of instructions and whatever. And the judge says, well, I need, I need a skeleton by the morning. I need a skeleton argument on this by the morning. So you've got to go home as a lawyer and right, let's get it cracked. And I think that's what being a cop and I probably being a lawyer does is it makes you get the work done. When it, I mean, I, I can procrastinate when writing it first draft, but when I get edits, I just get them done. You are 100% correct. <laughs> because I always say that I'll get my structural edits and there's a moment of like, oh God, they're back. And I'll get the email and I'll respond to the email. And I'll say, thank you very much for the email, for, for the edits. But I know I'm not going to look at them for a couple of days because I'm like, okay, I, need to, I need to psych myself up. But once I've psyched myself up, and I've gone in, that's it. If they say to me, 
And it's funny, they'll say, okay, we'll need it back. Let's say six weeks. I know they're going to get it back in four. L- line oh, edits yeah. the other day. Yeah, they were like, oh, we can have it back in four weeks. I'm like, you're getting it back in two. I'm not telling them that. The week, but, yeah, you're getting <laughs> it by the end of the week. Because it's, it's a deadline thing. Because you're used to a judge Can't. saying, to you, okay, yeah, I need to get an argument by, it needs to be filed by four o'clock this afternoon. You'll yeah, oh, you, oh, you, know, you, you have then, a court appearance. You get your note back from, uh, from counsel. And he says, I need you to do X, Y, and Z and get yep. these things tidied up. Right, I better get it done because the PTPH is in blah. And if it's not done ahead of that, I'm going to get, yeah, a kick I don't think, <laughs> I don't think I've ever, I may have, because I know I did, I asked for an extra month in to deliver my first draft. But that's different. That's just my draft. Yeah, and I'm different, one, and I, that's, yeah, that's and I'm using that. Yeah, and I'm using that as a buffer. Like, I may not even need it. But when it yeah. comes to edits, no, I've never you missed say... It. No, but if you say you need the edits by X date, you, you'll get it, but possibly Absolutely. a couple of days before, or even it, a week it's before. Because in, it's instinctive. It's a, it's a date. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a timeline. It's a deadline. Custody yeah, timely, yeah. it's going to run out if I don't get it done. <laughs> 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 exactly. All right, so what piece of advice do you wish you'd been told earlier in your career as an author? Ooh, I don't know, I'm not good at this sort of thing. First time I've seen you quiet. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know. I honestly, I don't. Everybody knows I talk too much. I honestly don't know. I think because I think it's been a journey, you know. And I think I, I think mm. if someone had landed it all on me, I probably wouldn't have listened to him anyway. Just do the work and trust yourself. You just got to do the work. Yeah. You? There's no shortcuts to doing the work. Do the work and trust yourself. Trust, trust you, trust your judgment. There's another couple of bits of advice I'd give myself, but I can't can't say those out loud. <laughs> other people might be offended, so I won't. I won't say. I'll tell you when we turn the camp when we stop recording. All right, we've well, got me for <laughs> tell me. All right, so Neil, are you an introvert or extrovert or a hybrid of the two? <laughs> Isn't it obvious? <laughs> to ask the question, everyone gets asked. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Uh, I am quite extrovert, I guess. I would never have guessed. Yeah, <laughs> but you're one to talk. <laughs> See, I, I, I describe myself as a hybrid. I'm fun mm. when I'm out there. I can do what I need to do, but I don't mind having my quiet moments. No, I tell you what, I love my own company. I mean, I am an extrovert. I'm when I'm in company, I'm I'm very extroverted. I'm a show off. I'm a natural show off. I really enjoy panels. You know, I'm not shy. I don't mind talking, standing up on my own, talking to a big crowd of people. Quite happy with that. But I love time on my own. I enjoy my own company very much. My happy times, a happy time is a long walk with the dog on my own. I enjoy the time in the house on my own with my thoughts, reading. So, yes, I can be away from people and perfectly enjoy that. I genuinely enjoy my own company. But I do very much enjoy the company of people as well. Yeah, and I'm not <laughs> yes, <shy>. you do. <laughs> You're definitely not shy. So what challenge or experience in your life shaped you the most? God, you've got me stumped again. I know. I knew I'd, it would happen. Challenge. <laughs> oh, experience. I like challenges. I like yeah. challenges. Having kids has been incredible. I love having kids. I've got three kids. I've got three sons. There's another one. Yeah, becoming a father in my 40s again. I was a father in, I was a dad at 20. I was a dad at 22, which is mental. But I don't regret anything, obviously. Because uh, they've got two great, you know, two great sons, two great grown-up sons. I've got a grandson now. Having having a son, uh, was I 44? Yeah, 44. That was brilliant. That was brilliant because that changed my life in a really good way. And now I've got a 13-year-old. I'm 50, coming up 58. In fact, I'm 58 next week. <laughs> and I've got a 13-year-old son. And it's fantastic because he's a cracking lad and I really enjoy his company. So... It was. It's not a challenge. I don't view it as a challenge. This view is something I did, you know. And having being a father again at forty-four, that's a that was really great. Was it hard the first time round when you were one hundred percent committed to your job as a detective and that covert policing and having uh, you had yeah. your kids at, yeah you had your kids that early is a balance. That is a balance, mm. and it's not one that I did very well at because. Certainly when I was on the homicide teams and I was on a proactive unit on the homicide teams, the hours I were working was ridiculous. I, I 90 hour weeks were 
commonplace. And I did that for five years. And so I really missed five years of my, my older boys growing up because I was always at work. I was literally always, I was always at work and mm. it became that thing because we were a very small unit that used to get called in by the, by the major incident, the major inquiry teams. And most of the time it would be when they couldn't find someone. We'd do the manhunts. And that would generally be on a Friday afternoon when they'd realize they couldn't fi- find someone. And so they'd say, yeah, homicide task force, we need you to find Joe Bloggs, who we believe has just murdered this other person. Can you find him? So the first thing we'd do would be, you know, do a bit of phone checking or banking check. And you'd say, he's just hit a cell mast in Manchester. And then we'd be in the cars driving to Manchester. And I might come back a week later. And, and so, yeah, that was, that, that was a compromise. And it's not one I recommend because your kids are only young ones. And I'm lucky I still have a great, a great relationship with my kids. But I did end up getting divorced. So, you know, the, the, the hours can play an enormous havoc on your life. But you get wrapped up in it because it's always urgent. Because we were always hunting a murderer. It was always urgent. But you, that is one of the lessons. Ah, you talk about advice. There you go. And go back. What advice would you give? I've just thought of one. When everything is urgent, nothing's urgent. <laughs> that is good advice. <laughs> that is advice because literally every single job was urgent. Well, if they're all urgent, they're all the same, aren't they? So, you know, I, and, and I, I got wrapped up in that. And therefore, I would end up working the most ridiculous hours, thinking Not that it. only I could do this work. And, you know, though, and then we, you know, coming into the house at 2 a.m., falling into bed, and then the phone goes again at 5, saying, we've just had a fastball happen. You need to get in now. And I'd be on the way in after three hours sleep. It, you know, when you look back on it, it is ridiculous. I, cause, I mean, it's not the same thing, but it is the same level of stupid hours as a defence solicitor. And I said, I'd be leaving a police that you would know. You know, I've been sitting yeah, in a police course. station with you doing an interview, and I've walked out there at four o'clock in the morning. I've got home at the I've got home at five. I've slept for an hour and a half, maybe. And then I've got to find myself at court to do a duty, mm-hmm. do whatever, do a trial. That finishes. And then, oh, you happen to be on the midnight, the graveyard shift for the police station calls. So from midnight to seven, I may not go out, but I'm, I'm getting all the calls. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's seven. It is. I'm, it's I, I, you never, I mean, you never hear me denigrating what, what defense lawyers, whether they be barristers or solicitors, do. I mean, mm. I, I could see the hours barristers work, prosecution, and, or, you know, during a the trial, they would always be at court before me and after me. So, yeah, I get it. I get it. So, yeah, the hours, you, you, and you, you don't always get, you don't get that time back when your kids no. are, are young. Or, and also you can end up with no, well, I have no life. That would be the thing. You can go through a period of your time where, where your work is your life. Mm. And that's not always a good thing. So I, I would caution anyone to, and I'd caution my younger self, that maybe, you know, the world don't stop turning because you're not at work. Well, you might have already answered the next question then, because it was, if you could go back to when you were 25 years old and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? <laughs> don't listen to him. Don't listen to that daft old git that's coming to give you some advice. He didn't know anything. <laughs> You'll work it out just fine on your own, mate. I think, I, you know what, I, I always say that. I, I, I do like to quote a bit of Nietzsche. We've all heard the, the Nietzsche, the, philo- the German philosopher quote, what doesn't kill me will make me stronger. I think you've got to go through the hard times to get yourself to the, the, the place where you can be truly happy. Yeah. Like, life ain't always a bowl of cherries, so therefore... I think you have to go through those bits and do that difficult stuff to find yourself in the position you might want to be in. Maybe. Or am I being a bit profound? No, you're just being real. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Walking bollocks as usual. But yeah, no, I mean, I, look, we, we, you've got to find your own way through it, haven't you? That's the thing. That, that's why I'm saying that, is that you have to... Everyone's path um, is different. And what may, what may work for one person is not going to work. Yeah. Again. And who's who's to say that bit of advice I give might lead him into a worse situation? In, yeah. Into a worse situation. So I'm not sure about that. I'm not finally, sure that. Neil Lancaster, yeah. where yeah. can listeners of the Conversation Podcast find you online? I'm at neillancastercrime.co.uk. I'm I'm on Twitter. You can easily find me there. Much as it's terrible, <laughs> I am on Threads, but I'm not very good at Threads. 
I am on Facebook. If you Google me, you'll find me. I'm not hard to find. I'm not secret. <laughs> no, like, I, I used to be. I used to be secret, but I'm not anymore. Before we go, like properly go, did you find it strange? I was talking about this yesterday. Moving, going from a private individual to like me before the book stuff happened. Everything I did was all my social media was private. If you found me, you, you'd have to wait to be accepted by me to become yeah. part of my followers. So everything I did was private. And then when the book stuff happened, I had to switch everything to public. Did you find that hard? Very odd. Very yeah. odd. Because yeah. quite the opposite, I objectively kept my face out of any type of media. You know, if there was yeah. cameras about, I was gone. I didn't want anything to do with them. Because my, my job was being covert. I was a surveillance officer. Yeah. You know, I was do, doing covert work, up close and personal with bad guys. I didn't want to be. I didn't want anyone to be able to Google me and find me. Now you Google me, I'm all over the place. I'm on. You like I'm on a. Stop. I'm on telly. I'm on. I mean, I'm on Discovery Plus at the moment with the <laughs> telly series. You know, I'm all all over the blooming place, and it is. It was weird. You get used to it, but it was weird. So yeah, it's a weird one seeing yourself on telly and then going, "Oh God, I'm looking old." Because they film <laughs> you close up in 4K, and you're thinking, "Jesus, I'm looking old," you know. So <laughs> it's fine, though. It's fine. It is what it is, isn't it? It is what it is. And on that note, Neil, can I just say thank you very much for being part of the conversation? It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode of the Conversation with Dean Matheson podcast. I really hope that you enjoyed it. I'll be back next week with a new guest. So make sure that you subscribe and you'll never miss the next episode. And also don't forget to like, share and leave a review. It really means a lot and it also helps the podcast. And you can also support the podcast on Patreon where every new member will receive exclusive merchandise. Just head down to the show notes and click on the link. And if you'd like to be a guest on a future episode of The Conversation, all you have to do is email theconversation at nadinematheson.com. Thank you and I'll see you next week.